mortgages. What is the process to find all the heirs? And, you know, that's one of the other problems running to is where you're going through the process. Everything looks great. You have, you know, three, four heirs. And that's it. And then all of a sudden they come out of the woodworks, right? And you're like, I got to start over. I got to resell. You know, it becomes a process. What is the process of finding air and how can they jump back in the middle of the process after you already served everybody? So I've actually never seen a, um, a, a time in a probate where all of a sudden we've done a probate and then all of a sudden somebody pops out. I've actually, I haven't seen it to date. Okay, good. Um, yeah. And um, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's the way I'm asking my questions. <laughs> uh, that seems to get to all the answers. Gotcha. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're always asking the heirs, you know, how many ever, how many, you know, some, some people want to say, you know, Hey, um, we're interested in the probate. Just shoot me an email with your questions. And I'm like, no, uh, we're going to do, we're going to do uh, how many kids ever, 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 you know? And it's like, as soon as I start getting on the phone and really yeah. communicating, we get answers. Right. So not only is communication with them key, um, and drilling that down, but even ask, you know, when we send the documents to everybody, if, if there's somebody missing or there's somebody that's not supposed to be included, they'll let you know, right? Yeah. Now, in terms of your world with foreclosures, that's what gets interesting, right? Because you're, yeah. shooting, uh, you're shooting in the dark when it comes to uh, finding heirs. You're depending on an investigator or an affidavit of due diligence or some kind of uh, document that's saying these are the potential heirs. Now- <clears throat> And then you get a guardian ad litem, guardian starts finding out more people. That's when it gets trickier, right? Because you've never talked to the source. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that you could do in those kinds of cases, and um, I've, had, I've had really good conversations with the investigator we use on quiet titles, okay. is not only just doing a first degree search, but a second degree search sometimes. Um, you may be going a little overboard with second degrees because now you're starting to- Explain what second degree is for those who may not know. Not just a not just immediate like spouse, children, but now you may be going like parents, brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews. So just a little bit out in the family um, because you never know. Maybe there was no spouse. Maybe there was no kids or parents or something like that. Um, you know, third degree and fourth degree going way down cousins and, you know, pre-deceased people, maybe probably too crazy. It's but removed, yeah. Yeah. And I'm just thinking in your world of foreclosures and doing yeah. due diligence. Right. Um, and because we see that in quiet titles, we, you know, we have, I have one right now where it's an adverse possession case and lady got title to the property more than seven years ago and she's been on a deed. So she's got grounds to claim title to the property. Well, mm -hmm. come to find out, we have to go back all the way to these two, three trusts. And I have 40 people we're serving. We serve 40 people and half of them are alive and half of them are dead. And, yeah. but here's the thing. We did our do, due diligence to try to find them. We found death certificates. We'll do a newspaper publication, you know, yeah. and this is, this is the world of not even probate. This is the world of due diligence and searching and trying to find these people. Cause I know where you're, I know where you're going with that. Yeah. Oh my Lord. Yeah, serving people. I'm, I've had that before where we thought we'd served everyone and then all of a sudden there was somebody else that we didn't serve or something like that. Or the court right. said, no, 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 you didn't serve properly. And so we had to go back and do it all over again. And it's a huge pain. So if you can get it right the first time, uh, it saves you just a ton of time. Yeah. And, and, and people, you know, um, a lot of times the, the lenders as clients to a law firm that's doing the foreclosure, you know, they're, they're, they're wanting to make sure that they're not overspending on costs, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, these things get expensive. Sometimes the, the filing and the service and all of it, yeah. but at the end of the day, when going through those, those suits, um, doing that newspaper publication actually is really critical. Getting that guardian at litem as the backstop is really critical. And so sometimes spending the extra costs end up uh, having a greater benefit later without having to go all the way back. Cause if you have all these measures, these, these backstops mm -hmm. um, you can move forward on this. And at the end of the day, what are you supposed to do when you can't find anybody? I mean, right. yeah. you know, you tried. So the one that you mentioned there, the newspaper publication, I know we've done that in the past so just to kind of clarify it. Is that, is the newspaper publication trying to find a specific person or that's just a public 
notification and and if we can't find them then that will suffice as publication both so yeah so actually it could be both it's first of all the the reason we're doing it is because we couldn't find somebody or or right. multiple people right we the process server tried going three four times mm -hmm. finding all these addresses couldn't find mm -hmm. them then we're doing a newspaper to that one person to put them on notice but then at the same time, we're kind of doing it out in the world to say, hey, there's a cause of action here. There's a foreclosure. There's a quiet title. Mm -hmm. Speak now and come forward. Um, but, you know, that that world is so different than probate. Like we that's a whole different world other than probate. And, you know, we can get into that. But probate probate is the is fascinating to me because a lot of people think it takes forever. Right. Yeah. They think it takes six, nine months, 12 months when I've done things in two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, two months. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. David's hearing that for the first time. Uh, <laughs> you, you should have seen everybody's face at the new view conference, David, when everybody, when I was telling everybody the timings are like, what? Um, and, uh, you know, and so buyers are now not waiting forever. They're not yeah. waiting forever on a deal, which is the best part about it. Um, but also the fact that so many of these heirs, don't have the money to front to do the lawsuit, right? They, or the, the, the probate, they don't have the money to do probate. So where I'm able to jump in is waiting until the closing, the HUD st settlement statement for payment. So um, the, the same would be even if there was a refinance and they had to do a refi um, and they were getting a cash out on, on the refi, were you even able to wait until that settlement statement for, for payment? And that helps everybody because mm -hmm. they wouldn't have been able to do the refinance. They wouldn't have been able to do the sale without some kind of useful structure to these deals. And I think that's been the model that's helped a lot of sellers go through these situations. So Pretty you're huge. talking two, four weeks, six weeks to do probate. And that's amazing, right? Um, is there something as a lender that we can do? Say we have an asset, I have, right, we have a bunch of assets right now that that a couple of them have some deceased people in there. We're having a hard time get a hold of, of the heirs, but they're paying the bill, which is, is what it is. We're happy about that. But is there something from the lender side that we can kind of get caught up on? And, and is there something I can do now to file it? We're trying to find out they file probate, limited information. We're trying to find out if they do have heirs, Who's there and what happened? Is there a way we can go get the court records, get the information and what kind of, you know, find out if there's any other errors and how much does it cost to do this as a lender to find out the information? So, you know, the public records in Florida are, are beautiful because everything's out there. You can go through the clerks of the court and find out if somebody's done a probate. You can search by maybe last name, first name, and see if you'll see a case number. Like, it'll come up in Florida CP for probate, circuit probate. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's out there. Um, and I think one of the ways that you can find it is uh, through those mediums. And then... Um, the other way is death certificates could be a great source because if if some if you know that the person died and maybe you have an uh, a name and a a date of death, there may be a way to pull the death certificate and see an informant that's named on the death certificate, and that could lead you to a mailing address or a name, and you can skip trace that name because somebody filled it out. Somebody filled out the death certificate, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that that could be another way of potentially finding those heirs in those situations um but other than that skip tracing genealogy uh reports like from a genealogist that aren't that expensive uh, somebody that can perform a full skip of you know who people are and where they are those could be ways that you can find heirs so it's it, it could be really really helpful because cool. that's the big thing right now is that if you're getting a a list of assets and you can see deceased right estate i kind of uh, steer away from them yeah right just because it's a little more hairy a little more issues what we're saying now is that this may not be true and i just wanted to comment you know victor said victor why just hello and uh sydney went through this coleman went through this during COVID. you know uh, some of the posts are coming through i'm curious though from this point of view is that what you're saying is we where should we be careful with looking at assets? What kind of gotchas are involved 
with this possibility of having a deceased person in dealing with that deceased issue? Well, it, it's also the fact that it, if you had the loan with the deceased person, mm -hmm. there's no recourse against the heirs. So if you're trying to, if, if you don't know if you're going to make your money back off the foreclosure and there's going to be a deficiency judgment, you're, you're, you don't really have that position to go after anybody for the deficiency because your loan was only with the deceased. So, right. um, you know, and the other thing is if you're, I, I don't know, this just came through my head. If you're finding assets or finding properties where there are these loans that are in the name of the deceased and they own that property, let's just say it's Florida, they own that property, that may be an investment opportunity actually because you can almost go in and see if you can help buy back buy that property and um, that's a, almost like a level of a distress right? So if you see that, a, that's an indicator of a distressed or maybe motivated seller. So mm -hmm. not even just on the loan side to try to make money off the interest rates and sure. payments, but on an investment side on the property could be good. Because imagine, imagine somebody had that loan for 20 years and they've paid it down all the way to owing 50K off the, on that loan. And really the ARV on the property is 350. Oh my gosh. I mean, so you're actually in a really good position. Plus you don't know what kind of repairs and what kind of value you're willing to offer, but what's, what's the risk when you're able to just pay down 50 plus an additional, um, up to the point where you would do rehab. Um, those could be sweet deals on an investment opportunity. So, um, that's how I see it from my brain. Um, you know, on, on the lending side of it, um, it's quite interesting because you just got to try to get in touch with those heirs too. Yeah. That's really interesting because it's, it's not uncommon where I'll see on a list of loans to purchase, it'll be in, you know, a state of, uh, or I, sometimes I even buy um, reverse mortgages with deceased borrowers, um, which I know a lot of people look at that and that's kind of hairy as well, but, but with the deceased borrower thing isn't necessarily a deterrent. Um, because there is a, a process set up to kind of navigate that and to, to help you to figure out how to approach that. And it doesn't always necessarily have to end in foreclosure either. And that's sure. usually when I look at a, an estate of name, um, my assumption is that we're going to go to foreclosure. And that may be true, but if we can do a probate and work something out with the heirs, uh, maybe not. It doesn't have to be a foreclosure. Yeah, we're trying to do mods, right? That's where our plan is to do a mod, put this thing or, you know, assumption if we can do assumptions, yeah. you know, but that's the angle here, right? But like Nathan said, we never really talk about this stuff. So deceased <clears throat> borrower is like, oh, I'm gonna have to go through probate. I'm gonna have to go through the process. I'm, <clears throat> the heirs, I have to work with people. And then you get to the foreclosure, you have the mail letters away and mail it to these people. They have 30 days to respond. And it becomes a more of an add-on process. But what you're saying here is it's not as big of a deal. It's just something different that we're used to. It's outside-of-the-box typical stuff um, that we shouldn't be afraid of it. I think if you frame it in a different way where you're looking at more of a investment opportunity, mm -hmm. um, maybe on the real estate end, that's when it could be uh, – interesting. And Nathan, you had me interested at the fact that purchasing reverse mortgage notes. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. There's, there's a whole, that's a <laughs> yeah. whole like niche on its own. Yeah. And yeah. I'm curious why they even would be for sale um, because those payoffs can be huge and they really put everybody in a tough position because there's there's such b large payoffs and the interest rates on reverse mortgages are are I mean they I remember I still remember one of the first one of the first probate cases I picked up when I started all of this like consistently mm -hmm. um, was the the beach property where there were these four uh, children ever. And one of them was a holdout living in the property. But, you know, at the time they saw me, the mortgage payoff was 425 mm -hmm. and the property valued, uh, you know, that anybody was able to want to buy it at was like 500, 525. Okay. And I told them, I said, 
you got to move fast. <laughs> you got to move quickly because those reverse mortgages add up. Well, the, the, they couldn't get the one holdout to get out of the house. Eight months later, they wanted an updated payoff and it was 485. Wow. And um, so, you know, that's kind of interesting about, about being able to buy, you know, I guess buy those at a, even a discount. Yeah. Um, I wonder what the lenders are seeing there as the opportunity to get out, you know? Typically.